My name is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. LibertarianProgressive.com is an independent media organization. We interview independent third-party candidates who are on the ballot. There's a lot more going on this election season on November 8th than just the presidential race. We, we believe Congress, a co-equal branch of government, deserves a co-equal amount of consideration in the media. Most polls have a consensus to elect all of Congress out. We want to make that decision easier for voters via presenting candidates who are the only third options in their districts. And today we're interviewing Everett Corley for Congress, who's running in Kentucky's third district for the U.S. House of Representatives. You can find out more information, Corley, C-O-R-L-E-Y, Congress.com. Everett Corley is running in the Forefathers Party. Everett, good to talk to you today. Thank you for being on the show and letting our listeners know some of the other options that are out there. And the Forefathers Party is a party I have not actually heard of before this year. So if you could explain to us what inspired you to be on the ballot this year and what inspired you to run as a Forefathers Party candidate, sir. Well, the Republican Party in Kentucky had run four candidates consecutively for office after losing this seat back in 2006 and each of those candidates had failed miserably against a far-left incumbent uh, John Yarmouth who uh, had a series of ethical issues that were never exploited upon and there had been a scandal two scandals involving the uh, displacement of a veterans hospital to a uh, and the use of the property the veterans hospital was sitting on was very valuable and the building of a tunnel instead of a bridge a tunnel under to get to a bridge across the Ohio River and the tunnel was over a hundred million dollars it was similarly equivalent to a Kentucky version of the big dig in Boston and no one would be was willing to bring up the reasons why that land was deemed historical and therefore protected and then why this hundred million dollars of taxpayers dollars was built and that was a big issue because uh, I believe that both parties were afraid to address that also there had been a big effort to remove uh, important historic monuments in Louisville and I was a political science major at the University of Louisville and I loved history and I was part of a lawsuit that uh, pre- prevented the monument, one of the with Civil War monuments from being torn down and that's why I used the name Forefathers because I believe in history. So some places are I guess sacred or a part of history that shouldn't be torn down for construction or energy or definitely should be considered something that goes beyond just present day needs is what you're saying. Is that right? I'm, I'm saying that in Orwell's 1984, uh, the first step of a totalitarian state is to erase history, erase, erase the good and the bad and the ugly as far as history is concerned. Uh, we, are, we see this in the changing of the names of streets. We see them in the schools refusing to read Tom Sawyer. We see them in the efforts to um, uh, control just about every means of thought that exists in, on the campuses today, college campuses, and this monument was just another effort only this time, this monument was 77 foot high, and we were able to take it to court. And while we weren't able to win the jurisdictional case, we were able to get a ruling from the judge that stated that the relevant authorities could not simply willy-nilly tear it down without having a proper place to put the monument. And that put the... Um, and since then, the university president, where the monument was located in, has since resigned and disgraced and thrown the whole issue of the monument uh, in, a, in a limbo uh, situation. So you're running against a Democrat 
incumbent who's been an incumbent for several terms who you feel like should have been, I guess I could say easy pickings, but the Republicans never yeah. took advantage of that. He should have been like one of the opponents of Donald Trump in the Republican <laughs> primary, just easily destroyed per se. So h- have there been any debates? Um, have there, are there any? The uh, League of Women that? Voters is playing a, uh, a debate in late October. Uh, I know everyone because of the Trump scandal, seems to think the selection is tomorrow, but there still is almost over 30 days until the election. And even though some people are early voting, but 30 days, you know, everyone talks about the presidential race being over, but 30 days is an etern- two weeks is an eternity in politics. And in the American people, unfortunately, their attention span is very short. And I really think, honestly, that both, unfortunately, the WikiLeaks uh, revelations about Hillary Clinton and the, the uh, quote, shocking, unquote, tape of Donald Trump are both going to be forgotten by, by the next uh, terrorist attack or by the next sports scandal or by the next pronouncement of Kim Kardashian. I really think it's, uh, obviously, one side has a huge benefit in destroying Trump, but on the other side of it, if he doesn't get out, then they're kind of just wasting their bullets. Sure, and debates are a long time American tradition. From the Lincoln Douglas debates, from Ross Perot, people might even know about the Jesse Ventura debate where he was mm-hmm. down before the um, in the polls before the debate he had for governor of Minnesota. Then after that debate, he actually became one of the few independent. Uh, candidates in high office actually he was on the reform party in that right. election so a debate can actually change the entire election that's why we have debates um, well people also forget that arnold schwarzenegger was running as a republican back in 02 in california but he was basically running as an independent and uh he had defeated a more conservative republican named mcclintock but the fact of the matter is is that pictures came out of him in Studio 54, completely naked. He had been in numerous encounters, publicized with hundreds of women, and well, he was single, and of course, uh, the drug use and everything else. So obviously, I, I think this is almost akin to what Trump, uh, Schwarzenegger went through the last month of his campaign, because people like Schwarzenegger or Trump or um, Ventura uh, men who have had and women who have had these kinds of lives are simply going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, have, have lived a little more exciting life than most of us, you know? <laughs> sure, sure, abs- absolutely. Now, have and you- I don't know whether that's good or bad. Maybe we all should have had a little more excitement. <laughs> well, uh, now, have you run for office before? Uh, as a representative? Uh, yes, I was actually the uh, Republican nominee for state representative in 2014 in the same area that I'm uh, in, in a district that was gerrymandered, where it was basically, uh, I was sort of a sacrificial lamb. And But I, uh, most of my support would come from the, uh, the uh, smaller government uh, freedom caucus, uh, liberty caucus minded people. And uh, that's that's basically, you know, the general parameters of my uh, my belief system. Now, since the incumbent is a Democrat, I would assume that a lot of people in your district are Democrats. Is that correct? Or what is your district like currently? The jury. Uh, it is a it is an urban suburban district. It has an urban core to it that basically is the primary political voting machine of it. The city of Louisville is in the Jefferson County. They're the same as in one one in the same. And so you have a strong college presence, a strong GLBT. Uh, community you have a strong african-american presence you have uh, a lot of people who come out from the rest of kentucky who are liberal who come to settle in louisville but then along the edges of the district like you see in a lot of places you see suburbs you see uh, more of a middle class and then there's also what i would like to call the the hidden working class that exists under a lot of these people 
that have been long ignored, that are the ones that are having to compete with uh, illegal immigrants for their jobs and kitchens and, and factories and, uh, and independent contractor jobs. And these men and women and their families, uh, there's over 50 million Americans, I mean, long-term people, families who've been in America for generations, who have been in the underclass, and Louisville has a huge underclass of these Amer forgotten Americans. And that, to me, is a, a great shame that uh, the elites are, have uh, forgotten the kind of people that, you know, fix their houses and build the bridges and drive the trucks and work on the cars. These are the kind of people that I want to represent. All right. And for anyone tuning in right now, we are talking with Everett Corley uh, for Congress, for Kentucky's 3rd District, running for the U.S. House of Representatives. He's going to be on the ballot this November 8th, 2016. You can find out more information at CorleyCongress.com, C-O-R-L-E-Y Congress.com. Let me ask you a question in a slightly different manner, thinking of three major words, competition, consensus, and actually those two words, competition and consensus. I, how are you going to bring consensus to you know, get a popular support to actually win. And, and now, and I was also running as a forefathers party candidate. Uh, you are the only third party uh, independent option in your district. So how are you going to compete as well? So h how would you approach that question? Well, uh, we gained enormous publicity by our um, st stand for the historical monuments downtown and we plan to, uh, in the next uh, 30 days, to uh, redouble our efforts to focus publicity on the preservation issue. We also intend to, uh, the Republican candidate has raised uh, virtually no money, has a few hundred yard signs, and uh, in a race that where the Republican candidate in the past has raised between 800000 to $2 million, it's been a uh, it's been a lackadaisical amateur uh, hour process for the Republican candidate. The Democrat isn't even putting up yard signs. So I think that with the with the kind of uh, publicity that people will be focusing on, and Kentucky is not a swing state in the presidential election, and usually when the Democrats pour money into Jefferson County to get out the what you might call the urban vote, the Democrat usually has an enormous base of votes to come from. But with Kentucky not being in play in the presidential race, the uh, Democrat is is denied these tools to get the vote out because there's no other competitive race. The Senate race is Rand Paul's way ahead of the Democrat. So the, there is no competitive races. And so that of that in an unusual matrix of of events of of uh, circumstances, I mean, that uh, affords an opportunity for some people to say, "Well, he's not the Republican, he's not the Democrat." Uh, there's a and with the Libertarian running for president, and with Trump running for president, and with the Green Party running for president, there might be a lot of people coming to the polls and sort of saying, "Well, you know." In, in their own way, Trump and Johnson and Stein are all outsiders, and so we could see something really benefiting that way. Now, let's look at some of your issues, and then I'll have some follow-up questions. You have here immigration, which you touched on a little bit. You have here energy, as well as, ta as, well as taxes, as well as the Second Amendment. And then you also have... Uh, uh, your Democrat incumbent <laughs> listed there as, um, and you already mentioned him before. So let's go to let's just t start out with the Second Amendment, actually. So what? How do you feel about the Second Amendment? What kind of policy, or how are you going to protect that when you are elected? And also, well, actually, let me ask you that first. Um, so what do you say about the Second Amendment? Well, first of all, I would not allow the government because of a arbitrary. No fly, no 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 gun, no fly, no no gun rule 
that's determined by the Department of Homeland Security to suddenly use that as a backdoor attempt to restrict gun rights. They could just put a million people on the no-fly list and just take people's guns away willy-nilly. So I feel like that is a an arbitrary and unconstitutional uh, respect. I would not support that. I would also not that, and that's the bill that comes up in Congress that the Democrats are pushing to uh, to push this no fly, no gun le- uh, legislation. I also would oppose uh, any attempt to go after the gun manufacturers in terms of litigation and making them liable for the actions of individuals who are involved in whatever crime or whatever issues involved. I believe in individual responsibility. And again, uh, we see in the highest gun control cities like Chicago, <clears throat> there's been over 4,000 people killed in, in the last eight years and many thousands more injured. So I think that my, my view would be, uh, and, and remember the Heller decision in the Supreme Court was only decided five to four. And so we have a real moment of truth on the second amendment which we you know if if you know if it looks like hillary is going to win at this moment you know it it could really be a uh, a uh, watershed moment where we be where we where where the american people will have to decide whether or not to obey their government or not yeah and even trump said he would look into that although he said he would try to find some due process provisions as far as the no fly no buy list and even bernie sanders uh was against legislation that would have made it easier to sue gun manufacturers and or or local shops selling guns that was one of the things he was criticized on but he stood firmly and said you know these gun shop owners can't be responsible if they're selling a legal product um what someone might do with them so as far as a no fly list goes even if that is used whether that's used for someone's right to buy guns or not should that be looked at just as an issue on its own because it's an american tradition it's a western civilization involvement that people get to know the accusers that are accusing them to be presented right. with evidence against them to have a jury of their peers to have a quick and timely trial the whole due process i'm probably missing a couple other steps here and there but you know, those are fundamental rights that make you know that you you have a society that's fair and that can have confidence as integrity and consistency across the board, equal justice for all. So the whole no fly list, I'm not saying FBI shouldn't investigate some people. In fact, they have been investigating people, uh, but maybe some of their superiors didn't follow up on some initial investigations or they didn't investigate uh, certain individuals all the way through. So should the no-fly list be looked at on its own, regardless of the Second Amendment? Yeah, absolutely. And and it's clear that, you know, when you have Jay Johnson at the Homeland Security and Loretta Lynch in the um, Attorney General's office and, and many, many more even radical people working underneath them, I mean, there are people with serious agendas uh, in these agencies that are contrary to just flat out contrary to the Constitution. Now, another thing about the Second Amendment, when I hear people defend the Second Amendment, I do think that that's all well and good. And, you know, the Second Amendment isn't just about hunting and fishing, and I appreciate that argument as well. I do think sometimes people should push back a little bit with some other solutions on their own, because the reason why most people who might be on the side of the aisle that are wanting to put more restrictions on the second amendment is to reduce overall violence so besides tampering with one of our bill of rights what is some ways that we could just reduce some violence in society overall well um, you know i i have been one of these people who have have have, uh you know i grew up in in the 70s and, and watching television and a lot and uh, as a child growing up and you know i i really think that some of the that 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 even though they have absolutely every right to say anything and everything i really think hollywood needs to exercise 
responsibility at least until the 11 o'clock hour uh, on some of these shows. I think they have gotten away with broaching. I mean, people seem to be so shocked about Trump, but the fact is, is that this is nothing that hasn't been going on in television since the late eighties, early nineties. I mean, people have been getting away with talking about, and I'm, I'm all for freedom of speech, but the fact is, is I think that there has been an attempt to cover subjects with, uh, a uh, level of uh, purian interest to to the extent where people are so uh, numbed to any kind of uh, real sense of proportion and right and wrong that you know you do have kids who are just going to go to school and they just have simply no sense of of, of shock or a sense of moral decency about things. I'm not talking about from a religious point of view or anything like that. I'm just simply, I'm just simply uh, a, a sense of decency and a sense of uh, empathy and pity for their fellow students, who uh, you know, people who are a little bit different from them, people who have, who may be smarter than them, people who are in the higher classes or in the school, or people who are or in in or in, the, in the shop classes or whatever it is. I think it really starts with these kids and, and mostly, and that's why so many people go to private schools or homeschool is because the public schools have become in a sense a, a, a zoo where the lowest common denominator uh, gets, gets, uh, occur, occurs. And we, uh, and so no, none of the pathologies of our society is even addressed. It just goes from, it goes from the PlayStation two to the, the school to the drugs to the, uh, the to the purient aspects of television and, and, and the internet and the cell phone, and I just think that we haven't even begun to grasp the level of uh, uh, sowing that we're going to reap when uh, uh, reaping what we're, we have sowed. I mean, as far as what society is is coming down with, but the only. Uh, uh, and that's why I believe sometimes that people do need examples out there. And, and it seems every time there is an example, that example becomes distorted and destroyed. And so it's it's a very complicated question. And I, I, I don't know. I think the roots of violence have a, have, have a lot to do with also, uh, 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 you know, you have two unalterably opposed forces. You have the drug the drug gangs, and then you have a, a law enforcement industry that they both seem to uh, be invested in each other's uh, workings, and it's a it's a very scary situation, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like you kind of remind me of what um, John Adams said. With this type of, I'm paraphrasing here, but the type of government system that we have is only going to work with a moral society. Yes. And so uh, and it might come back to culture and education and good examples, like you said. And it does seem like a vicious cycle with the, um, it seems like the drug cartels and then also you have the, uh, you know, the government agencies that fight them and they both seem to fuel each other in some ways. And actually, the senator that you mentioned earlier, Rand Paul, has tried to build some consensus as far as yes, he has. a different approach to the war on drugs. Do you think states like Washington, Oregon, Alaska, I think Washington, D.C., um, you know, Oregon, California, soon to be maybe, do they have the right to uh, end prohibition, per se, and should the government, federal government step in and stop them from doing that? Well, it's a very complicated subject because you have age you, the, because because it has to stop at the age of consent and and I believe after the age of consent, I believe definitely there should be uh, a loosening of uh, a lot of the laws because in a sense we've ended prohibition anyway because the the number of prescription drugs are so flooded our society and so many people are on antidepressant, anti-anxiety, um, <clears throat> other kinds of anti-psychotic drugs that are legally prescribed. And then you have the overwhelming prevalence of 
marijuana. And then, of course, here in Kentucky, you have the whole heroin death spiral with the um, with uh, with this uh, 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 this new drug that's in heroin that's killing all these people. I, the name escapes me at the moment, but the fact uh, something hab- habitual or something like that. But anyway, uh, it, no, it, it was a fentanyl, fentanyl, yeah, fentanyl. And uh, the fact is, is that it's killing people. It's a hundred, it's a thousand times stronger than morphine. And uh, the fact is, is that, uh, uh, and then that's caused a resurgence of the AIDS epidemic in the, uh, up in the rural counties where they, where they are manufacturing these poor people, the ones I keep mentioning, uh, are manufacturing this heroin. And, uh, so it, it, it would, it would be honestly better to just, I mean, I hate to say it just to have the straight old fashioned heroin back again, because at least that didn't kill people. I mean, to the extent that this is killing people nine or 10 a weekend, and because uh, they won't even, they can't even revive them. You know, you can, you, and, you know, in the seventies and eighties, you could, you know, if someone was just doing solely heroin, they could revive people. You know, they would look terrible, but I mean, you would survive a heroin overdose. But in in many cases now, there's absolutely no way to survive the heroin with this new drug in it. And so I think the the drug liberalization laws need to be um, seriously looked at. I think, obviously, for med- medical purposes, uh, with prescriptions, that's, of course, entirely necessary. But the, you know, the, the, the Colorado experiment has gone overboard with the manufacture of things like cookies and brownies and food products, because I think that should not occur, because that's far too accessible to... Uh, whatever the age of consent is 18 or 16 or what have you, there's far too many and they have, they haven't been lethal, but I do think that a, a 10 or, or nine or 10 or seven year old should not develop coma like stages from eating one of those items. I think that is certainly not in the interest of the larger society. Right. Like you said, it's a complex issue and there's a lot of unintended consequences. Um, I think, and Absolutely. one of those unintended consequences is there's a lot of people arrested each year for simple marijuana possession when people that commit uh, rape and or murder are getting out of jail quicker than some people that are just simply doing possession and families being split apart. But honestly, I think a lot of this has to do with our economy. I guarantee if the economy keeps going down, there's probably going to be more drug use. And if the economy oh. gets better, there's probably going to be less drug use, and, which goes into your issue of taxes. And, uh, yes, and, I, and, I, and it's not to be racial or anything because it c- covers all races and backgrounds. But the fact of the matter is there's an increasingly desperate uh, underclass of uh, broken white families out there in America that's starting to mirror what's gone on in the African American community, and these broken white families, the the level of pathology, whether it's the parents doing the drugs with the kids, whether it's uh, uh, you know terrible things happening to the children at early ages, whether it's incarceration of the youth, even in uh, JV centers, whether it's drug use or uh, terrible violence or uh, uh, predatory being pr- uh, 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 victims of sexual predators, whatever it is, the fact of the matter is is that this kind of uh, pathology is just, uh, uh, and then you throw in what I mentioned with the, with the whole rap media culture uh, sort of uh, capitalizing. I mean, the fact is, is I'm all for the free market, but unfortunately, the free market knows that there are these 50 million Americans who still have money that, and they and they're catering to them, and they're catering to their pathologies, and they're catering to their sort of the opium of the masses kind of attitude. And I hate to quote Marx, but that's what he called religion. But the fact is that there is an after there there is a uh, irresponsibility on the part of of uh, people that didn't exist before in, in, in the elite economy to take advantage of people. And I think, I think that the, uh, you see that with also the immigration, I mean, both the Republicans and Democrats, the Republicans benefit from illegal immigration because they want 
the cheap labor and the profits and the overseas locations for their uh, corporate offices with no pain, no taxes. And the Democrats merely see it as a demographic demographic shift to uh, increase their voting power. And so, uh, so the mid- the middle of America, which would which would neither support or condone amnesty or uh, or the, or uh, or uh, uh, the sort of Ill- vanishing of our borders, they're not they're completely ignored. And so and 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 and, and from this kind of uh, from this kind of alienation uh, arises. You see things. You may see a lot more uh, Columbines or Timothy McVeighs. Not that I'd ever advocate that, but it's inevitable that you will see an alienation among the youth that will eventually turn violent. There's just no question in my mind about it. So, would you agree that you know probably ending prohibition will put a lot of the drug cartels out of business? For people who do have a serious issue, it'd probably be less expensive to treat the drug issue as a health issue as opposed to a criminal issue and putting people yes in pr- I, for for the addicts and for the uh for the and for the people who are ar- uh stopped and caught with casual uh you know amounts of drugs i absolutely agree with you for the uh but for the you know tra- for the you know cartels and the gangs and the, the people who do other things i think that uh absolutely there should be, you know, almost a, a Singapore type attitude towards the predators in the in the drug industry. I think I think uh, we've, we you know I think I think it should be a two tier approach. Sure. I think for for the Americans and for the poor and for the middle class kids who are being sucked into things. I think yes, of course. But I think for the the Mexican cartels and for the uh, the Chinese uh, and the heroin people. Afghanistan and all that, the Russian drug dealers and all, I think definitely there should be no mercy towards them. Yeah, well, the mafias, I mean, you know, if they're not selling drugs, they're going to be selling something else. So putting that aside, yeah, that's a criminal issue. But for people on small amounts and stuff like that, I can't imagine something worse than putting them in with a bunch of hardened criminals and seeing what they're going to look like five years from now. Oh, absolutely. And, 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 of course, they come out. You know, and, 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 you know, before they get arrested, you know, the pathology of the younger people, they'll be in their early 20s and, and they'll be unmarried, but they'll all, already have one or two kids and they'll already have and the and the and the and the, and the, and the baby's mama will already be in a situation where she's in a, uh, in a in a probably a dead end job and dropped out of high school. And, you know, it just the cycle just continues and continues and continues and continues and no amount of government spending, and I mean, there's, I mean, there seems to be almost no, no way out of it other than uh, a radical, like you said, a radical change uh, to how people are approached. Now there will be some people, you know, that take advantage of this attitude, and obviously we have to uh, be aware of, uh, we have to be smart about it. Now, what about entrepreneurship? I mean, how? Someone who wants to open up their own taxi company has to buy, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollar medallion or whatever. Isn't that wouldn't that be the approach to help in the economy? I mean, we see the trend of entrepreneurship, people starting mm-hmm. their own new small or mid sized business. That line, that trend is going down. It has been for the last Oh, it's terrible years. because the banks will not loan the money. Most American businesses in the starting in the forties and fifties started out with a thousand dollar loan from their local SNL or uh, uh, or bank or, uh, or or a credit union or what have you and they were able to then uh, pay the loan back while also making a profit on a hardware store or a or a, a, a small trucking concern where they would do some sort of labor work or a, or a, or a apartment complex or whatever they wanted to get involved business they wanted to get involved with and that was the nexus of how uh, entrepreneurialism began and or even a farm they would buy a farm with that thousand dollars and you know obviously the money would be more now it'd be more like twenty thousand dollar loan but the the result would be the same and there's absolutely no 
no under the under there's no uh, the interest rates are zero thanks to the federal reserve because the interest rates are zero the banks have no return on the money they lend and so that has that is completely destroyed if we had i hate to say it but if interest rates were th- they were eight percent under jimmy carter that was too high but the fact is if, if we had a moderate interest rate of three or four percent where people the banks could get a return on their loans then of course they would loosen up the money and they could let let some of the money get back into the economy but no one is the only people making money are the people that have a stock portfolios over two or three hundred thousand and they're getting these huge returns every month and 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 that's coming from wall street that's not coming from uh these kinds of these these startup companies that were really the heart of middle class america Sure. Now let's kind of sum this up all in one thing, because some of the situations does seem a little bit bleak. We're kind of stuck in a rut. You can kind of use a garden analogy. I mean, if you have a garden bed and if you have, you know, just a bunch of bad stuff in it, then your tomatoes and your watermelons or whatever are not going to look too good. But if you clear that garden bed out, put the best compost, put the best minerals, rock dust, whatever in there, compost, tea, etc., and you have earthworms crawling in. You know, it might take a while, but eventually you're going to have a flourishing garden, and that's how we can turn it around. So combining your issues of taxes, energy, immigration, because they all kind of they're all part of that garden. You know, what's the American garden going to look like in 10 years? What are you going to propose to have a thriving, you know, shining city on the hill, streets paid with gold, entrepreneurship, et cetera? Well, the historic is like going back to square one where I said my major was political science and history as forefathers party. I think history has shown us whether it's the, you know, Britain under Churchill during World War Two or de Gaulle, France under de Gaulle, or I'm not advocating any authoritarian type of leaders, but I do think that if we had someone who uh, in office at the top who could be a uh, however imperfect he or she were, could could be someone who would constantly push Americans and be an example to tell them that, you know, this is not about, you know, what, what your grievances are. This is about pushing forward and making sacrifices. But no one's willing to tell Americans to do that. Until we have a leader who is willing to do that and say America is, you know, America is, like you say, a great garden or a great place, I think we must we, we, we've got to have somebody like that. We've got to have somebody somehow to light that candle in the dark. And until that happens, I think we're going to be in kind of a, a malaise kind of situation. But I do believe that millions and millions and millions of Americans can be inspired. They just, you know, there's just a lot of people who don't want to see them inspired because there's a lot of profit to be made by America that's that is weak. And I think I think I think that that's the struggle is to discover even among imperfect candidates the good that they can do and perhaps uh change America for the better. Now let's say you can't pass every single piece of legislation that you want to. I mean after all it is a body of 435 yes. members. And actually that's kind of a good thing because if people are thinking, you know, whether a vote for you would be a wasted vote or not, you could also respond, well, it is a body of 435 members, so, I mean, if you're going to take a risk on anything, it wouldn't necessarily be at the presidential level. It would be at the congressional level because there is that buffer of 435 members. So even if you can't pass everything that you um, want to pass, what would be the other message for, by s- electing um, a third-party candidate, a forefathers party member? What kind of message would that send? How would that start to open up people's minds to possibilities? Well, well I think it would have, you know, I think that uh, the two-party system obviously is a as is, is an acronym anyway. We look at the advanced democracies in Europe and Canada, and people obviously have a greater choice when they have four or five different parties in par in their parliaments or their congresses. And I think that if um, I think in the long run with the Internet and other things, I think that, you know, what I tell people is regardless of myself, if I win this election, you're still going to have 434 Republicans and Democrats in the Congress. And so, you know, but at least my election would tell people 
that hey, it is possible that that one one vote maybe they would be an, it would be narrowly divided. Maybe they would need to listen to somebody from the outside on some of these close votes. And in that case, I think the, this lost 50 million Americans would be uh, would have a voice, and finally uh, they would be listened to because the elites of both political parties, the level of disdain is just breathtaking towards the American people. The hatred and the and the contempt, it, it, I've never seen anything like it in my life. And I think that if somebody from the third party was to win in a blue collar district like this, I think it would be it would be uh, it would force them like you, the UKIP party in England forced them to pass Brexit. I mean, that's probably the greatest uh, event for a third party ever to happen because in history of Western democracy. And I think if that happens, if, if, a, if, a, if, that, if that kind of thing happens in America this November, then I think you could certainly see uh, people. Uh, we need to see the leadership of both political parties basically uh, disempowered. And so there needs to be uh, uh, even if even if the Republican and, and Democratic parties are split between left and right, the radical liberals and the and the and the and the socialists versus the you know business Democrats and the you know the conservative Republicans versus the Trump Republic nationalist Republicans are split into even if we end up with five parties, I think that would so benefit the American people because. There, there the concentration of power at the leadership of the two political parties has really melded into one, and it's it's a dangerous and 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 they pretend to f- fight and argue, but it's really a conspiracy to do nothing. Yeah, we're the only uh, first world nation that has a you know two party system, so some competition might make them you know open their eyes a little bit and take a second look and. You know, think more about their constituents because they are kind of taking them for granted. I mean, you can look at poll after poll of what could the consensus of American people want for the last 10 or 20 years, and then you can see what is actually being proposed and passed in Congress, and they don't match. They don't match at all. And so let me just ask well, you. Well, like term limits. I mean, 80% of Americans supported term limits, and then they got the Supreme Court to rule them unconstitutional. But the Supreme Court was wrong. I mean, term limits apply to the presidency of the United States. So how do you, how do you, how do you address that contradiction? Sure. I mean, that's a good point. And what about the TPP? Uh, would you pass the TPP as it currently oh, is? Oh, I mean, I absolutely would not pass the TPP. I think the T TP- and you know, this is where we see the the president, the the, the 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 candidate, the Democratic candidate for president, had to lie her way through the primary. And now it comes out that she was she was for open borders and open trade by these WikiLeaks. Say, Julia Assange, we need to build a statue to. But I think that the fact of the matter is, is that if, if she wins, both parties will conspire to pass TPP over 70 percent of the Mer- American people. And 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 the 50 million lost Americans will become even more lost. And I think. I think the elites. This will. It'll become. It'll be. It'll be like uh, Washington D.C. is already the richest city in America, which was never meant to be. It was meant to be our industrial bases, like Detroit and Harrisburg and Scranton and and Cleveland and places like that, and our oil cities in Dallas and Houston. It was never meant to be these political power centers, like media centers, like New York or Los Angeles, and. And so we see um, TPP uh, just expanding the power of these elites in the rest of America. And that's exactly what happened in Rome before the fall. You had the entire Roman Empire in Gaul or Iberia or Germania or Britannia or, or in, in the East, Eastern Roman Empire. You saw the entire middle class, the, 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 the average Roman, if you would, completely – separated from what was happening in intrigue and the corruption and the really, you know, uh, irredeemable aspects of Rome itself. Uh, You know, the stories and everything, Caligula and Nero and all the rest people know about. But the fact is, is that you, you see that happen in Washington. You see Washington, New York and Los Angeles and maybe Chicago and the rest of America 
with the exception of a few islands, are, are just, you know, we're just basically some kind of servant class. And it's, and it's, it's very, and, and I'm, we're all tired of it, you know? We're very tired of it. So in, in what you're saying, a lot of people have compared the U.S. to the fall and decline of the Roman Empire, and maybe it is inevitable after so much success that the next generation becomes fat and lazy, but I think Greece did have a second revival, and we also have the Internet now, which is totally unprecedented, so it's almost like the second printing press exponentially. We, we, we do have, no, we still do have a very powerful... Uh, working class in this country that is more than capable of de- deciding this election and electing whoever it wants to. If 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 even a, even if a third of those folks vote as a block in this election coming up, it would sway enough swing states to decide this election. So yes, there is still a very very powerful middle class in this country, but the problem is is that the media is very powerful too. And they will continue to uh, distract and uh, demoralize. And that's what they do in Washington is they demoralize the voters to the extent where they don't vote or they or they vote the wrong way. And the demoralization tactics, whether it's, you know, October surprises on WikiLeaks or lewd tapes or whatever, these kinds of things are, are just the very poison of democracy, the poison of democracy. If if we if I, I'm not advocating the media cover up things. That's not what I'm saying. But I think the the uh, responsible and every reporter has a responsibility to report the news. But they also have a responsibility to understand that if a nation is, is in crisis, what is their responsibility as as for the aftermath of what they report? As for as as for influencing and altering an election? As as for there has never been a perfect president. There has never been a perfect congressman. There's never been a perfect mayor. So I mean, if you dig deep enough, you're going to find anything on everybody. And the kind of people who don't have anything on them are going to be so opaque and mediocre that they're not going to have the energy and the vitality ever to get anything done. They're just going to speak and double speak. And nothing's ever good. Like Mitch McConnell of Kentucky, he may he may he may have led a very boring life, but he is so wrapped up in the money culture of Washington that nothing is ever going to change. And so in a kind of uh, contrarian way, it's almost the, it's almost the most uh, what intemperate people that sometimes are the most capable of, of, of changing things and standing up and, and not being afraid to lose anything. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Everett. And yeah, I think Mitch McConnell and some of the other people are pretty low energy. <laughs> but um, so, uh, and I do think the media do it does have more of a responsibility to let people know about Congress and also let people know about indep- people that are on the ballot. You're just as on the yes. ballot as anyone else. Now, just two more topics real quick before we sure. stop the interview here. Um, energy. I mean, we have enough oil and gas in America where we don't need to feed our addiction in the Middle East, but should there be, um, and I think that's pretty well established, but should there be some environmental uh, safeguards, uh, specifically talking about fracking, should should there, if they're going to do it, should there be some more safeguards where they can insure, should they have to get insurance or something like that? Well, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that there are enormous regulatory burdens that that these companies and these people have to go through. I mean, the the whole idea of the um, if the the truth of this is that yes, there in the beginning of fracking, yes, there was some there were some areas in Pennsylvania and this and that were that you could safely argue that were uh, damaged. But I think there have been you know it's it was a learning curve as with everything, and uh, I do believe that fracking and uh whether but you know why did we have to go to fracking and that was because back in 2000 back in 1996 both houses of congress passed uh the anwar pipeline and anwar had enough oil and natural gas to fuel america almost 60 percent for the next 20 years and it was vetoed by president clinton because of some billionaires 
in Hollywood who were uh, opposed to the that it became a cause celeb for them. And so there have been at the top serious mistakes made about uh, the proper use of American resources. Also, nuclear energy was another thing that was the people at the top, you know, they over uh, uh, sensationalized the Three Mile Island thing in the late 70s. And nuclear power could have been, I mean, Japan is 80% powered by nuclear power. Now, you could argue about Fukushima, but no one's talking about building a nuclear power plant on the edge of a fault line, which, which Japan did. So, I mean, that was a that was just a crazy thing for them to do. But the fact is, is that I believe that both nuclear and the proper use of the Anwar reserve and other reserves, a uh, proper uh, um, offshore drilling are, are would more than uh, make up for fracking. I am concerned about fracking, but I think that fracking is uh, a, a consequence of not going through more readily accessible and there's plenty of more readily accessible oil and natural gas and uh new energy through nuclear than there are through uh fracking but they just have to allow them to do it you know i hear what you're saying yeah it might not have it was an option that came as a consequence of some other uh, situations now we have military bases um and here's final subject here and I, i'll have one other follow-up question i mean we have military bases in west germany south korea we're protecting saudi arabia I, I don't know maybe that is in our best interest but maybe it's not i mean can we still be the most powerful country and not have 800 bases in across the world well you know this is this is where you know we get into the point of national security sort of uh sort of melding with globalism and whether or not, you know, w whether there's a separate responsibility for national security that does not involve globalism. And if in my view about that would be, look at the Cold War. I mean, in the Cold War, there was a, there was a worldwide threat of a super empire of the Soviet Union and at one point even China altogether and in that case, you know, we had to defend Western Europe against imminent invasion and Japan against imminent invasion. There is no real threat against imminent invasion from any part of the world to the United States anymore. And so at this point, American military power is basically just an extension of, of globalism. And I do believe that in isolated cases, perhaps in South Korea, where you are facing a nuclear kind of madman and and this kind of but but all these countries uh, could do more to share bear share their uh, share of the load and i do believe that america could i mean certainly i mean england you know once only has two air has no aircraft carriers right now they have two that are getting ready to be online but and france france had two aircraft carrier has two aircraft carriers and russia only has one so i mean we have to and that's the real projection of power overseas, and we have 16. So the fact is is that the United States should be judicious about, my view would be we would focus on this hemisphere first because that's where we share the common borders with, you know, uh, instability in Cuba or Venezuela or Mexico would be our first interest. And then, but as far as uh, the Middle East, I think that has been a, a, a horrendous, terrible mistake for us to be involved in this this, this never-ending war between Shiites and Sunnis, between Israelis and Muslims, between Indians and, uh, and Hindu and Muslim, you know, it's just, it's just and, 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 and then there's five different sects in Lebanon. But Everett, the phone is cutting out just a little bit there. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, can that, you hear me now? Yes, that's better. But I mean, there's so many sects, and I just sect S.E. CCS in the Middle East fighting each other, that it's just, it, it, I think we should step back from this. And uh, the Libyan thing was a disaster, the Syrian thing was a disaster, ISIS has been a disaster. So, I mean, I think, it, and I, and I think we have to be, uh, have, have a more of a, more of a uh, uh, localized approach to our military than being in places that have absolutely alien cultures to the United States. And one final question is, who are some of your favorite people, 
past or present, Everett? Well, uh, I think Churchill is a, a very strong... I'm sorry, I have to say, the phone is kind of... Um, I might need to call you back real quick, but it, it is kind of fading out a little bit. Can you hear me better now? Yes, yes, sir. I would, I would have to say... Uh, 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 I think Churchill was one of the great leaders. I think Theodore Roosevelt was a very uh, great leader. I'd have to say uh, some of the uh, senators that stood up for America during the Cold War, you know, uh, were, were, were strong leaders. I, I think that uh, many, many, many leaders can be great, but they do, but they're not not necessarily are good. And I think we have to understand that sometimes. In a crisis situation, a great leader is not necessarily a good leader, and 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 I think that uh, people are want to feel good about their leaders, but they but they don't understand that in a world that we live in, uh, it's a it's it's a it's a, it's a ruthless world, and sometimes uh, uh, no one pr remembers who loses the chess game. But I think I think that I think that uh, I would say. Um, that uh, I, I admire, like senators, like the senators, uh, certain senators in the United States from the, from like uh, you know, people that tried to bring America together before the Civil War. Uh, I think Calhoun and Webster and some of the great people that wrote the Federalist Papers. I think, I think it's uh, even Everett Dirksen, a Republican from Illinois. I think there are many people that that tried to bring. Uh, a consensus and and make things work and I think the people that try to make things work uh, at the expense of uh, of the powerful I think that's where we need to go towards awesome and we do thank you again for your time to enlighten our audience about other options that are going to be on the ballot this November 8th 2016 uh, the Congress is where it's at and that's what we think the Koch brothers people if they're not familiar with them but they're billionaires they're not even yeah. you know contributing to any presidential campaigns they're focusing totally on congress because they know that's you know where the well i could say the real power lies or that's where a lot of a co-equal branch of power lies so we think it's just as important and we think they're they're on the right idea there so yes yeah, so let's focus on congress and any final words of wisdom everett i would just urge all americans to understand that they have it in their power even the poorest ones even the ones who have had jail sentences even the ones who have dead-end jobs you know, who Hillary Clinton called baristas and uh, uh, living in their parents basement all of you have a great destiny ahead of you and I all of you are Americans and please believe that a brighter day can happen all right. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I hope you have a good night, and thank you for the interview, Everett. We appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity, sir. Thank you indeed. All right. Take care. Good luck in your campaign. Good night. Thank you. Good night.